I thought uh, we would take a little different tact uh, with this particular program, and uh, that was uh, to take a look at uh, some of the uh, strange uh, marine creatures that we find in the Bahamas. Uh, I've been to the Bahamas uh, probably 52 times, uh, and in those times, uh, I've discovered uh, many, many unusual creatures. So I thought we'd begin by taking a look at some of the smaller creatures, starting off with zooplankton, uh, the animal creatures, uh, the juveniles of uh, many of the marine forms we'll be seeing later on during the presentation. If, uh, as Joyce knows, if you're a swimmer and you open your mouth, you probably swallow some of the creatures you see here on the screen. I don't know how delicious you'll find them, but they certainly will add to the protein content uh, of your diet. And many of these creatures uh, go through a metamorphosis in which they go through different stages of development and ultimately turn out to be some of the animals that we'll see uh, coming up. I thought we'd start with worms. Uh, and worms, of course, are exciting. Uh, you may not think so, but uh, this is a Christmas tree worm. And frequently you find Christmas tree worms on uh, coral. Actually, they embed themselves into the coral. And if you look uh, near the base of this Christmas tree worm, you will see a little door with uh, two horn-like structures at the base. And whenever a predator comes along to feed on them, you can see uh, uh, a way of uh, pulling that trap door uh, to be behind and uh, the worm will therefore protect itself from any predators that uh, come along. These are filter feeders mostly, and they uh, will occasionally, if they don't escape until they hold, get fed upon by fish. This is a yellow fan worm, again another filter feeder, and frequently found in uh, some of the lime rocks near shore or uh, mixed in amongst the coral rubble and fantastic ability to lay eggs. Uh, one particular yellow fan worm will actually as many as 50,000 eggs uh, in one uh, setting. So uh, uh, again, uh, a very unusual worm, one that you would look uh, more closely for uh, near the shoreline. Uh, these are feather duster worms. Feather duster worms, again, they live in tubes, but they're more papery-like. And again, uh, they have photosensitivity, uh, so that if a shadow of a fish were to come along, uh, the feather duster worm would pull back into the tube. Uh, they're preyed upon uh, by fish and are primarily filter feeders uh, that come along and, and capture some of the planktonic creatures uh, that you saw earlier uh, in the program. Now, here's an unusual worm. It's called an elongated worm, and its uh, uh, species name is Picta. And uh, they're a little parapodia. You can see them stretching out along the side of the worm, and the parapodia enable it to crawl across the rocks and look for food, uh, tiny pieces of uh, detrital material that it will feed upon. And if you look down toward the bottom or the base of the slide, you actually can see that it has little light sensitive areas that act as eyes. Not the kind of eyes we're familiar with, but certainly good enough to uh, avoid being eaten by some prey. Now, this is the ice cream cone worm. This one primarily lives underneath the sand and it takes little pieces of coral and algae and uh, pastes them together. And the worm, of course, lives inside the cone and uh, hides primarily from crabs and fish, which are its primary predators. It will feed upon uh, some of the detrital material that's underneath the sand, and it has little tentacle-like apparatuses for carrying out that purpose. Here is the cast of an acorn worm. I'm sure you're familiar with it because most of you probably have seen it on the mudflats uh, when the tide is gone out. 
Now, I must admit, it do, look, does look like a pile of poop. And in some ways, it is a pile of poop. This worm will actually suck in uh, when the tide comes along and actually sucks in some of the detrital material, feeds upon it, and then discharges what's left behind into the pile that you see at the top slide. At the bottom, if you look very closely, you can see the bottom part of the worm actually uh, getting rid of its poop. Bioworms, uh, one that you need to be careful of if you're snorkeling uh, amongst the rocks and amongst the corals, mostly uh, under coral debris, you'll find the fireworm. You see the little hair-like projections extending from the leg-like apparatuses, which we call the parapodia. Those little uh, structures are actually stinging cells. And if you get stung by one of these creatures, you will know it. And then you will know why it's called the fireworm. The fireworm I've actually encountered a couple of times under rocks. I've lifted a rock while I've been snorkeling. And uh, in one instance, uh, my t-shirt went up that I was wearing and the fireworms flew up from underneath the rock, underneath my t-shirt and then the t-shirt went down and I could feel the fire from the fireworm, which unfortunately lasted two days and I needed to go to the hospital to get corrected to, with a problem. Uh, this one is a strange kind of worm with uh, stringy-like projections that come from the rocks and it's a medusa worm. It's actually more closely related to a sea cucumber. And uh, there are quite a few of these that are found in the nearshore environment under the limestone rocks, and they filter out uh, many types of foods that they find on the rocks or that come floating by. Here we have a ribbon worm. Uh, this poor ribbon worm is actually being fed upon by little marginella snails. If you look very closely in the center of this particular worm, you can actually see part of its digestive system. This worm actually carries a toxin in its body, and it's a toxin that's uh, similar to what you find in a puffer fish. And uh, it is highly poisonous, not that I expect you to eat one of these worms, but I suppose that some of the creatures, uh, the fish and so forth that do eat it uh, may find the toxic uh, undesirable. And it's probably a way of this particular worm it, preventing itself from being consumed. Now here's a peanut worm. Again, found uh, sometimes under the debris of rocks and also buried in the rocks. Uh, have you know that uh, there are places in the world where the peanut worm is actually cooked and you can eat peanut worms. So if you go to Indonesia and you uh, might find them in the market, uh, you can ask them uh, if they haven't cooked them already to cook some up for you and you can have some peanut worms to consume. I don't know if they taste like peanuts. I've never tried them, but next time you go, you, you might try them. Aligned flatworms. This is another one that's found in the Bahamas, uh, mostly under rocks. There are something like 50,000 species of flatworms. Sometimes they're identified incorrectly as nudibranchs, but nudibranchs have gills that are very uh, significant on the body structure. And uh, you uh, usually see what uh, we will call rhinophores on the one end of the creature. This thing has little eye-like structures on the end of its body, but they are not rhinophores uh, as they are in nudibranchs. Take a look at a couple of more uh, of these flatworms. Here is one that's found both here on this coast of Florida in uh, the Florida Keys and also uh, in the Bahamas and Caribbean, and it's the netted flatworm. And you can uh, see that this animal has the ability uh, to flex its flat-like body structure, and it can swim in the water to escape some of its predators. Here's a bicolored flatworm, but this one also 
uh, has the appearance of a nudibranch, uh, one that's commonly found in the Bahamas underneath some of the coral rocks. He's a bumblebee shrimp. This little guy is uh, actually uh, has some toxin affiliated with it, or you might pick him up and uh, get a little painful shock from the presence of the bumblebee uh, shrimp. This is the banded coral shrimp. Uh, this guy actually likes to live on sponges. Most of the time you'll find them inside the body of the sponge, but you can also find them in other structures and they will take advantage of anything that's on the bottom of the ocean where they can hide bottles, uh, cans, anything of that nature. So if you go out and you want to see if you can find yourself a, a banded coral shrimp, uh, you might want to check out the cans and bottles that are uh, littered on the bottom of the ocean, unfortunately, at times. And this is Pedersen's cleaner shrimp. This one is uh, a unique uh, shrimp. He actually has these very long extended uh, claws. So if you look at the top uh, of the picture here, and these claws are uh, used to capture small fish and crustaceans that are in the water. And uh, this Pedersen shrimp uh, actually eats the, the little uh, feet of sea cucumbers and it's part of his diet as well. This is a short clawed shrimp. He's uh, related uh, to the snapping shrimp, but he lacks uh, the very large claw that the snapping shrimp has. And interestingly enough, he has uh, uh, blue legs, uh, kind of a, a unique coloration pattern. And he also has some uh, blue antennae. Uh, this one is uh, one uh, that is still being discussed and uh, we're find, trying to find out what its uh, true scientific name is. We'll probably give it one in a couple of years. This is a Caridian shrimp. Uh, again, another species that is unknown. It uh, has stripes like a tiger and uh, brilliant blue uh, tentacle um, antennae that uh, extend from the head end uh, of the shrimp. This is the peppermint shrimp. If you find it, uh, if, you, if you crab traps, you put a crab trap and it's an old one and has uh, coral attached to it. This is uh, one of the foods uh, that the uh, peppermint shrimp eats. It actually feeds on the tentacles of the, uh, of the coral that are found in some of the traps. It's a snapping shrimp, and it's one that's found on the West Coast, Florida Keys, and in the Caribbean, and also the Bahamas. It produces a, a loud popping sound uh, if you have them in an aquarium. The interesting thing about this shrimp is that it's not the popping sound that it uses to capture its prey, nor the claw, but it creates a bubble. And uh, when this bubble bursts, it releases uh, something like 5,000 Kelvin of heat. And the, it's that heat which actually knocks the prey out and enables the snapping shrimp to catch its food. Uh, that heat is so intense that some people have compared it to being equivalent of being found on the surface of the sun. Here's a lima shrimp. Probably haven't seen this one too frequently, but it is found in lima shells. It's only about maybe a half an inch or a little less in size, so I've uh, kind of enlarged it so you could take a good look at it. And it actually feeds on the little uh, tissue that extends from the lima clam. And so it's that primary food that serves this particular creature. Now, this is the scaly tailed mantis, but also it is known as a thumb splitter. And if you look to the right uh, on the bottom there, you can see the claw. And the claw is kind of bent back like that of a praying mantis. And if you were to pick this fellow up and not be too careful with it, it would reach out with that <laughs> claw and snap back and cut open your fingers. So it would be one that you would want to be extremely careful of when you try to pick it up. It is edible and uh, does provide a lot of uh, meaty back 
uh, uh, portion of its body. And so, yeah, if you find one, make sure you wear a glove and uh, yes, you can steam them up and they're delicious. Now, this is the eye of that shrimp. It's a compound eye and uh, it does have the ability to detect uh, any shadows that come over the top of it. It primarily, the shrimp lives in little uh, tunnels uh, underneath rocks, uh, but it does have the ability to avoid predation by any fish that might come along or one that it might want to eat. Uh, related to that uh, shrimp uh, that we saw earlier, it's a ciliated full squilla. And we have a number of different species of these which are found throughout the Caribbean and the Bahamas. And they, they feed the same way as the other ones that we've seen, other one that we saw. This is the dark mantis. Again, a similar species. These, the last two don't get as large as the first one. They are probably half that size. The first one you looked at was can get up to maybe six inches, but this one here is probably no more than three inches in length. Here we have the sand crab. They're particularly found on sandbars uh, out in the Caribbean, in the Florida Keys, uh, the Bahamas. If you look at the very rear end of the crab, you will actually see uh, the abdomen and it's here uh, that the eggs are carried by the sand crab. This particular sand crab is actually in the process of molting. It's getting rid of its uh, external shell. And if you look, you can see the separation between the soft part uh, or the new shell developing underneath the harder old shell, which is present there. Up to the right are uh, the two very uh, long eye stalks of this particular sand crab, which actually becomes food for fish and other crabs that live on the sand flats. And this guy spends most of his time buried in the sand. Uh, here's the yellow-lined arrow crab. And again, this is a creature that likes to hide in debris. And it will also be found in crab traps, uh, these stone crab traps that uh, some of the fishermen uh, bring up. Notice it has a pointed head. Uh, maybe it's characteristic of some relative that you know. The uh, pointed head actually serves an excellent purpose for this particular crab because it'll find food on the bottom. And if it's already eaten its quantity of food, it takes uh, the rest of the food and sticks it on its skewer-like head and saves it till later on when it wants to eat. Here's the banded porcelain crab. Again, this is found in the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean, and in the Bahamas. A very flattened crab, enabling it to hide in crevices away from predators such as fish and crabs uh, that come to eat it. It's uh, its coloration pattern also helps it blend into the coral masses that you find in uh, some of the deposits on the bottom of the ocean. A warty crab, a very common species, uh, one found along the shoreline, uh, particularly at low tide, and they have little warty-like uh, claws and uh, some of the warts actually extend to the back legs of the creature. It's primarily a predator on other crabs and other uh, debris that they find uh, underneath the rocks. Now we're gonna look at box crabs. And this is a rough box crab found more in sandy sediments. They also carry a device to protect themselves. If you look at the bottom picture at the very top, you'll see a sea anemone attached to it. And the sea anemone becomes a defensive weapon against any predators that come along to eat it. This is probably a female crab that will carry eggs later on. Again, the rough characteristics of its body enable it to hide in some of the coral rubble on the ocean bottom. And here we have the flame box crab. 
This particular species is colorful, again found on sand flats, and one that we used to find quite frequently in uh, one of the islands we visited during our trips to the Bahamas in uh, Chub Cay. And he is a rough box crab. This particular species is almost white in coloration. And if you note it, it has little leaf-like extensions to the edge of the claw. Look along the side there and you can see these little leaf-like extensions. That's part of its uh, unique structure. And there are also a couple at the top of the carapace on the right side, and you can see them on the left side. You can also look very clearly between that little black dot on the crab, uh, lower to that are the two eyes of this particular box crab. Here is the nodos rubble crab. <laughs> this guy's really small. He's only about an inch in size. He has uh, uh, little uh, growths attached to the surface of his carapace and also to its claws. And again, uh, these particular structures help hide the crab from some of the predators that might feed upon it. Here's the sponge decorator crab. You know, you think, God, this guy's going into too many crabs. Uh, but. I really like crabs, and they are really interesting in their behavior. This particular crab will actually take a small piece of sponge, attach it to the top of its shell, then use the claw. If you notice, there's a very scissor-like claw on the left side. And then as the sponge begins to grow, he actually cuts the sponge around to fit the carapace he actually also cuts a hole in the sponge to allow his eyes to stick out uh, from the side of his body. Here's a Dromnia crab, and this is a kind of special crab. I've not seen too many of it, although some people have said that they have seen it here on the West Coast. It's probably one that is present here. And this is a female what this particular crab does, if you look at the very top edge of the crab, uh, you will see little feathery-like projections present on it. And those feathery-like projections are actually attached to a snail. And uh, it's actually a leucine uh, shell, and that creates a suction so that the crab can actually adhere to the shell and then when the shell is on the bottom, he pulls the shell over on top of himself and walks along the bottom. So perhaps the only way that you probably realize that this particular crab is there is by the fact that you'd actually see a seashell walking across the bottom uh, with a pair of legs. Here's the hairy crab. And you can see quite clearly why they call it a hairy crab. And uh, again, uh, the outside surface, kind of a, a periostracum you would see on a shell, actually served to protect this crab from some of the predators that would like to feed upon it. The green clinging crab is a very fast moving crab and again lives under coral debris on the bottom of the ocean. Its ability to move quickly is one of the ways that it uh, is able to escape some of its predators, which usually are larger crabs or small fish. And here's the banded clinging crab. This fellow is entirely a giant. He's actually a quarter of an inch in length and gets its name from the banded patterns that you find on the shore uh, on the uh, claws, sorry, and also on the legs of the crab. And this is a clinging crab. Unique, but not very big, about a half an inch in size, living under, again, coral rocks uh, or other coral debris. Uh, and uh, if you look very closely to the claws, they're bent inward uh, so that they're kind of bent back, and uh, let's see if we can find them. Uh, 
closer to the head or the body of the crab, you'll see it. And the crab has little dotted eyes. This is the gray pitho crab, and it's a female, and she is pregnant. She has a bunch of eggs that she's carrying underneath that abdomen here. And here is, again, the uh, bending back of the crab's claws back toward the ab abdomen, which makes it a characteristic feature of these particular species. And again, you can see uh, some of the hair-like projections, which uh, blend into the seagrass beds where they live. Now, here is a giant crab. If you look very closely, uh, you're looking into the mouth of a pen shell. And right in the middle of that pen shell is a pea crab. And the pea crab likes to feed on the gills of the pen shell. That's one of its primary food. It also can be found in mussels. So those blue mussels that you like to eat when you go out to a restaurant to eat, and every once in a while you get a crunchy sound in your mouth, you probably just chomped on a pea crab. There are lots of hermit crabs of different kinds all over the world, and there are quite a few varieties that are found in the Bahamas and the Caribbean and the Florida Keys. We find some also here on the west coast of Florida. This particular uh, hermit crab is called a star-eyed hermit crab. And if you look at its eyes, the very tip of its eyes, uh, you can see these star-like structures at the end uh, of its eye stalks. Now, did you realize that hermit crabs have little eyelashes? <laughs> and the eyelashes on hermit crabs are actually used to keep debris off their eyes so that they can see, uh, just like you have uh, eyelashes serve the same purpose. Here's the white speckled hermit crab, and a very unique one that's found in the Caribbean and in the Bahamas, and it has very distinctive blue eyes and white speckles that are all over its body. Coral polyps, of course, are places where a number of creatures hide, and also uh, the polyps themselves are fed upon, as we said earlier, by certain species of shrimp. Here's a relative uh, of those corals. This is called the blue button. This blue button is about an inch in diameter, and uh, is related to the jellyfish. Does it have stinging cells? It does, but not very bad. You can get stung by these and it feels like a little tickling sensation. If you look in the center, you can see uh, the mouth of the blue button. Uh, again, these guys are fed primarily upon fish uh, and are washed ashore. I've seen them as far north as North Carolina and I've seen them all the way uh, down into the Southern Caribbean. This is the upside down jellyfish or the Cassiopeia. This particular jellyfish is capable of swimming, um, but spends a great deal of its time upside down with its umbrella in the sand. Algae is grown on the tentacles on the underside and act as food for this particular species. They're does have stinging cells, but not something that you would find particularly bad as far as the sting is concerned. This is a burrowing anemone. And uh, this particular species uh, will attach itself to a shell or to a rock that's in the sand. The top, you can see the tentacles at the very top at the left end of the slide, uh, will be at the surface of the sand. If you walk on the sand and you notice that there seems to be a sinking sensation that something is trying to get away, uh, quite often it's probably a burrowing anemone which is retracting back down to the shell that it's attached to. 
This particular anemone is called the tricolored anemone. And the tricolored anemone, uh, you can see the base uh, of the tricolored anemone to the left, and you can see the tentacles extending to the right. This particular species will attach itself to shells that have hermit crabs in them. And as the hermit crab goes along feeding, uh, the tentacles of the uh, tricolored anemone will actually collect some of the food which is washed around uh, by that feeding hermit crab. An unusual uh, but common uh, anemone is the corkscrew anemone, and it gets its name from the little ring-like corkscrew uh, structures which are found on uh, its tentacles. And this is the Antillian file clam, and uh, this is the uh, one of the clams that uh, of the creature that you saw earlier, a little lobster-like creature that actually feeds on uh, the tentacles of this Antillian fire clam, file clam, and it's one that is frequently found on the piling. So if you if you take a dip net and stretch it up a piling. Uh, you probably will scoop up one of these file clams, and sometimes you will get some of the uh, creatures that are inside or attached to the file clam. This is a flamingo tongue, uh, one of the few shells that I put in here, uh, but it's uh, one of the, I think, prettiest uh, shells uh, alive. Um, color is magnificent, and we see it frequently uh, feeding on uh, some of the sea whips or sea fans uh, uh, that are out in the ocean. And another one found feeding on the sea whips is this fingerprint uh, siphoma, also found in the Bahamas. It's not an uncommon species, but less common than the previous one. Keyhole limpet, uh, in this case, uh, you can see at the base, uh, the foot of the keyhole limpet, you can see the shell at the very top. We turn it over in the next slide. Uh, we can actually see the bottom of the keyhole limpet. And to the right, you can actually see the mouth and the antenna of this particular creature and the very extensive foot, which goes all the way back to the left side. And slipper shells. Uh, all of us have found slipper shells, and to here we can see the bottom uh, portion of the slipper shell. Uh, we can see its little tiny eyes and its foot, uh, and we can see the gills. If we look very carefully, we can see little uh, gills extended between the foot uh, and the mantle area of the slipper shell. This is one that actually changes sex. Uh, usually slipper shells like to pile on top of one another and the one on the bottom is always a female and the one on top of that female is a male and any other slipper shell which is in the pile is a male. And if the female dies, then the male turns into a female. Here we have the coffee bean trivia, and I don't know how many of you have seen one of these alive, but they're really a beautiful uh, creature and uh, uh, look something like a cowrie and uh, distantly related to the cowries, but you can see the mantle uh, extending over the shell and you can locate the eyes to the left of this particular creature and the siphon above it. So we occasionally find these under rocks uh, where they feed on some of the debris that's there. Now, left on the top is actually something that people find on the beach in the Bahamas. And the first thing they'll ask you is, what is that? I can't imagine what that could be. Well, actually, uh, that's the egg case of a chank shell. And you can see the chank shell down to the bottom. Uh, and it's a common species uh, in the Bahamas. And it's also a very common species uh, that we find in fossil deposits in Florida. But for some reason, after the last ice age, uh, the chank shells disappeared uh, from the Florida peninsula and only remained behind 
perhaps because of the warmer waters uh, in the Bahama and Caribbean. This is the doghead triton. And the tritons are actually found throughout the world. You can find this particular species in the South Pacific. Uh, you can find it in the Caribbean. You can find it in South America, uh, just about everywhere. And you can see the foot uh, like projection coming out with the operculum attached to that particular foot like structure. It has some plants growing on it, which uh, actually act to conceal the species uh, from predators and the periostracum, which covers the shell. Here we find this particular one actually laying eggs, and there are hundreds of eggs in those little deposits uh, that you see on the top side of the shell. This is impulse chitin, and uh, you can see the girdle uh, around the chitin. This particular one is about an inch and a half long, and the girdle actually, per, uh, and the perculum, uh, not the perculum, but the uh, tissue that covers the uh, uh, shell, actually help protect it from predation. And it's a nocturnal species that uh, moves along uh, the rocks at night and, and feeds upon the algal material that's present there. And here, this is the slender chitin, and it is a huge chitin. It's actually about a half an inch in length but one of the smaller chitons uh, that you find in the Bahamas, and uh, not too uncommon, but if you look under rocks, you're bound to find it. Now, what is this? Well, this is the warty sea cat. The warty sea cat is actually uh, related to the sea hares, uh, the ragged sea hare uh, that you find uh, up on our beaches occasionally. In fact, we just had a newspaper article about ragged sea hares being washed up by enormous numbers onto our beaches. But the warty sea cat uh, will get in uh, amongst the, into the turtle grass and other sea grasses where it feeds. And if you look very carefully at the bottom, you can actually see the eye of the warty sea cat right there. This is a smooth bubble sea slug. It's also a plant eater. It does have a shell uh, and uh, a green body, very common in turtle grass. Uh, if you have a net, a D-frame net or other device that you can scrape along the turtle grass beds, you can capture some of these uh, smooth uh, bubble uh, sea slugs. And here we go to nudibranchs. These, this particular tana Nudibranch is common, actually found on the mudflats uh, of the west coast of Florida, but also found uh, in the flats uh, in the Caribbean and in the actually the Keys. And this is the uh, Spirilla, a large uh, but uncommon nudibranch that's found here. If you look very closely, there at the very bottom, that's the head of this particular nudibranch, and those two ear-like projections are the rhinophores, and uh, those are the nose of the creature, and it uses it to the uh, possibility of finding prey, or could uh, use it to locate uh, another of its species uh, for mating purposes. Works dorid is one that's common in the Bahamas, uh, a very large uh, nudibranch. If you look, you can see the gills with its breathing apparatus uh, located toward the back end of the body here. And uh, the spotted pattern helps uh, uh, hide the creature from any predators that are present in the water. And again, uh, you can see the, the rhinophores up to the right-hand side protruding from the head end. Here's a, another one called the warty side gill slug. The rhinophores are little square-like apparatuses on the right. If you look to the right very carefully, you can see, and we have these uh, little bumps on the top of the creature, which can act as uh, breathing apparatuses. This particular species is not too common. Uh, but can be found uh, in, in the Bahamian and Caribbean waters. 
And this is like the one I like because it's the most, uh, one that's very common, but also very pretty. And this is the common lettuce slug. And you will find it amongst the sea grasses uh, uh, in the Bahamas, uh, whether they're uh, the turtle grass uh, beds or uh, some of the other uh, types of uh, plant life that's growing on the bottom. Uh, here you get a head-end view of this particular creature. Uh, and picture of its very distinctive rhinophores. And this is a, a, an unusual creature that's probably about five millimeters long. And you find it uh, bacilia and you find it feeding on plant life. And again, it's, uh, you can locate it at low tide under some of the rocks uh, uh, that are covered with calcareous algae in the Bahamas. Caribbean reef squid, a very common species, but uh, the best time to find it is in April or May in the Bahamas. And usually you find them laying their eggs uh, on some of the rocky surfaces. If you look very carefully, you can see in each of the eggs uh, a little tiny squid beginning to grow. Common octopus, uh, found uh, in a variety of holes. It'll actually uh, live in, in shells, or it can be found in tin cans or jars, whatever serves their purpose as a place to hide. They will capture uh, small crabs uh, and uh, fish uh, that are found in the bottom. A lot of times they like to come out at night, and uh, so uh, when prey is easier to find. And this is a sea star found in Cat Island in the Bahamas. This is the only one I've ever found, and it's an unnamed species of sea star. It's exactly one quarter of an inch in diameter. And it doesn't, as far as I know, get any bigger than that. And nobody from the University of Florida has been able to identify it. Uh, we know what uh, particular genus it belongs to, but we do not know uh, what species it is. Uh, blunt brittle, uh, spine brittle stars, very common. People frequently confuse them with octopus, uh, but uh, they are not. They are a member of the sea star group and uh, they're very fast and uh, hide underneath rocks whenever predators come to prey upon them. And the giant basket sea star, usually found in deeper water, but often found uh, attached to uh, sea whips, sea rods of that type. If you look at the bottom, you can actually slide, you can actually see the mouth of this particular sea star right there. Here's what one of them looks like when it's attached to a sea rod. Variegated urchin. One very common in the sea grassy areas, not only here, but in the Bahamas, and uh, some people like to eat them. They just slice them open and take open and gobble down that nice, juicy, liquidy interior of this particular urchin. Long spine sea biscuits is one that we frequently saw on the sandy flats, uh, particularly in Chub Cay in the Bahamas. Not something you want to step on, by the way. And here we have a donkey dung. And I guess thought that particular sea cucumber actually looked like the dung of a donkey. This guy has an anus uh, at the right side. And from that anus uh, living inside him is a pearl fish. And the pearl fish comes out of the donkey dung at night to feed and then crawls back into his butt. Uh, and actually feeds on pieces of the donkey dung at night at, uh, during the day uh, when this guy is crawling along the bottom. Uh, so if you have a tickling sensation, you're standing in the water, make sure it's not a pearl fish. Holoquin sea cucumber, one of the smaller ones that's found in the grassy seabeds. Here is a beaded sea cucumber, and it's uh, like Velcro. It's, 
it's a creature that uh, if you pick it up, it will stick to your hands and then it will stick to your legs and uh, you will have a hard time getting it off because of the two feet that are clinging to you. And the appendages at the front, uh, the tentacles are actually used to collect food off of the sea bottom. And the bronze cardinal fish is actually found uh, living inside the pink conch that you see at the bottom here and uh, actually will feed upon portions of the pink conch. Now, everyone uh, can see the fish in the upper right-hand corner, right? If you look really careful, where is the fish? There it is. The tail is extending off to the right. And uh, this particular fish is called a sargassum fish. The bottom right shows you uh, an example of the sargassum fish clinging in amongst the uh, weeds, uh, sargassum weed, and it feeds on small crustaceans that live in there as well as small fish. And here's a peacock flounder, which has the ability to change color and blend into the bottom of the ocean, especially where the rub coral rubble is. And these are mangrove tunicates which are actually filter feeders, and they filled on some of the filter feed on some of the small life forms that are in the water or the detrital material that's in the water, especially around the mangrove roots. And finally, the encrusting tunicate. These encrusting tunicates come in a variety of colors. They can become, uh, they come in pink, they can come in green color, whatever it is. And once while I was working at the Nature Center, somebody brought in a bucket of pink ones and said, look what they had. They had found a fortune. Uh, they thought they had got a whole bucket of whale vomit. And of course, I had to tell them that they didn't have whale vomit. What they had was an encrusting tunicate uh, and so they were very disappointed. They were not going to have whale vomit to bring to a perfume factory so that they could make more perfume. And that is the end of my program. Thank you for listening. Gary, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Your photography is beautiful. And, you know, we learned so many new things. Very cool.